During my career as an athletic director, I was asked to speak publicly many times, but the format was always the same. I was asked to roast an individual who was retiring in front of an audience that had way too much to drink. No one is retiring tonight, but I do feel a certain comfort level with the audience that we have here this evening. I would be remiss if I didn't start by thanking the Old Timers Committee of the C Club for my selection into the Hall of Fame. If some of the references in my acceptance speech seem somewhat dated, such as a young Bob Wallace, Colin Normal, or a good-looking Al Stockholm, it's because this speech was written in 1975. <laughs> As a chairman of the Hall of Fame committee, and before anyone asks, no, it is not this one, I, un I understand how difficult it is comparing athletes from different eras, different sports, poring over endless pages of statistics, reading wordy letters of recommendation from individuals that owed the candidates a favor. I thank the committee, com committee members of the C Club for the willingness to take on this task and discharge their duties in such a professional manner. I would also like to take this opportunity to congratulate my fellow inductees on their storied athletic and professional careers. I feel proud to be inducted alongside of them in the class of 2016. I would like to express my gratitude to friends, my daughter Cheryl and granddaughter Taylor, my significant other Anne, who have come to share this evening with me, and to my loyal teammates, some of whom have traveled great distances to be here. We celebrated victories together and commiserated in defeat. Actually, we never commiserated, but it sounded pretty good when I typed it. When we lost, we got on one another. But most importantly, we developed relationships and bonds that last a lifetime. Adjectives describing the classical athlete, such as big, strong, fast, and powerful, were never used in a sentence with my name unless it began with, he is not. <laughs> as Dr. Tomek kindly told me once during a physiology of exercise class, before the era of political correctness and participation medals, you don't belong to that gene pool. <laughs> Athletically, I was an acquired taste. Never the bright, shiny muscle car that you wanted to drive to school, but more like your grandmother's Honda Civic that you were embarrassed to be seen getting out of. It. Only after paying for your own gas did the dependability of that Civic impress you. I was that civic. I learned at an early age that if I was going to compete with more physically gifted athletes, it was not going to be from the neck down. I sought to outthink my opponents at every given opportunity. I also knew that I would never be option A, so I learned to be patient, to prepare, and to perform when provided with an opportunity. My life plan as a teenager was to be drafted by a major league team at the conclusion of my senior year in high school. In retrospect, at five feet eight inches tall and 152 pounds, that might not have been the best course of action for me. Fortunately, my family believed in backup plans and looked to college, even though neither of my parents ever attended. My father brought me to Cortland on a cold midwinter Saturday night and we checked into Lester's Five Heart Star Hotel in Cortlandville, New York. Early Sunday morning, we drove to campus. We first visited the baseball field, buried in snow, surrounded by a chain wing fence. Absent of press box, dugouts, PE center, and field house. We then ventured onto campus, just Brockway Hall, Muffet Center, Old Main, and some dorms. We visited a dorm observing no signs of life due to the early hour, bathed in an aroma of stale beer. That was the dorm, not my father and I. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know why, but I knew this is where I belonged. She wasn't bright and shiny to me at the time, but I grew to appreciate this collegiate version of a Honda Civic, a decision I have never regretted even one moment in my life. 
I played four years of basketball at Corlin under three different coaches, won the Red Letter Award twice, yet started three of those four seasons on the bench. I was an acquired taste. I won the Red Letter not because I was the star of the team, but because I knew who the stars were. Berkey, Crust, Williams, and later, Idell, Anton, and Rogers. My unique ability in the scheme of things was to get the ball to superior gifted athletes where they could best use their athletic ability. My baseball career proceeded more normally, being the number one pitcher all four seasons. I attribute this to Coach Wallace's ability to spot talent better than most. Coach Wallace and I had a special relationship that grew and deepened over 50 years throughout my career and attendance at all of the alumni baseball reunions. I grew to realize how much he cared for his athletes and their families and how much he loved his university. I also appreciate that as one of his final acts here on earth, he made sure that I got nominated to the C-Club. It's hard to believe that 50 years ago this week, I started my calling career as a PD scrub for Prof Holloway's soccer team. While I appreciate what coaches Moran and Dondero did for me in high school, and Qualman coaches Greve, Williams, Stockholm, Fuelling, and Wallace did for me here at Qualman, helping me grow as an athlete and person, there is one reason why I stand here tonight, and that is my father. A product of the Depression, quit school in the eighth grade to help support his family. He believed in athletics and security and passed that on to me. Became a New York City fireman, worked as a moving man carrying furniture on his back, up and down flights of stairs on his days off. Oftentimes he would come home after working all night in the firehouse, all day on a moving truck, shower, have dinner, and then say, do you want to go get some? we take off four baseballs to the schoolyard, he would pitch, I would hit, he would chase, over and over again. Luckily, I didn't hit the ball very far. As a dumb teenager, it never even entered my mind that he might be tired. In the fire department, he would volunteer to work every single holiday, to get time off to see my high school games and never miss one. During the summers of my college career, I would pitch from him to him from our shaded driveway over a fence into the sunlit backyard, the only way we could get 60 feet, six inches. At this time in my career, I was throwing the ball pretty well, and I know he had trouble seeing me. He had a paper thin, catch his mid, because he wouldn't spend the money to buy a better one. Every once in a while, I would come inside with a fastball. He'd roll the glove, take it dead center in the palm of his hand. Never said a word, took his hand out of the glove, squeezed it once or twice. I would follow that pitch with one of my famed 59-foot curveballs off his shin. Couldn't afford shin guards. He'd hop once or twice, and then say, let me see that one again. After high school games, he and I would go out to a place that he found that had 10 cent hamburgers that were no thicker than the padding in his catcher's mitt. We would eat, virtually talk for hours, going over every situation that occurred in the game, whether it was basketball or baseball, and what could have been done differently. No pressure, no right, no wrong, just options. Learning the mental part of the game. Whatever athlete I was, what became, I owe to my father. Never the biggest, strongest, fastest, or athletically gifted on the field or court, I competed confidently, believing that I was athletically superior from the neck up. In summary, I am both proud and humbled by my induction into the C-Club, and would thank again all those who took time out of their busy schedules to share this honor with me. Thank you.